Hello everyone. Um, welcome back. This um, this presentation is called The Foundations of the Study of American Politics and Government. And what we're going to do here is talk about some of the theories of um, how um, a government like ours is supposed to function, uh, alternative interpretations, and uh, uh, some of the key concepts that you need to, uh, to get introduced to the study of politics. Some of these concepts include the idea of legitimacy, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, the whole notion of a liberal democracy, um, and uh, which is the type of government that we have and that almost all governments have uh, in the world. There are some that are not liberal democracies, and um, some are basically authoritarian systems of one sort or another. But we're going to focus on how liberal democracy works. Um, and a lot of this is based on the notion of consent that a government is based on the consent of the governed. And that is its, its right to rule. It comes from the consent of the governed. Um, going from there, we're going to talk about different theories of how things may be organized. Um, we'll talk about the model of liberal democracy, and we'll also talk about a different interpretation called elite theory. Now, I introduced a little bit of this in the previous video. I'm going to go into more detail here about it. And the competing theory of pluralism. We'll talk about the notion of collective action and some of the problems with collective action. And then we'll wrap up by talking about the whole notion of normative and empirical statements and the difference between them. So that, you know, when we're talking about things, we can understand what sort of statement we're making. And as we'll learn, you know, both normative and empirical statements have their place in the study of politics and government. And we're going to talk about that a bit at the end of this presentation. So. Keep in mind, um, as we go through this, that um, we're going to be looking at or thinking about three different ways of understanding the, the, the nature of our political and governmental system. And um, one of these models we, I'll be referring to as classical liberal democracy. Um, and then I will, we'll talk about something called elite theory. And then we'll talk about pluralism. Those are the, the three main alternative explanations. We're going to begin by uh, talking a bit about the concept of uh, uh, legitimacy. And I'm going to begin this by talking about this gentleman, uh, Max Weber. Max Weber was a, a German sociologist who uh, lived from 1864 to 1920 and is really considered the founder or one of the founders of the whole discipline of sociology. And he was also very, very interested in the study of politics and government and different, different ways that nations could be governed. And he had all kinds of theories of where the nation state comes from, what government is, and how culture works, the impact of religion and capitalism on our governmental structures and so forth. And the thing I wanted to focus in on in particular was um, he, uh, he described uh, different ways of legitimizing a government. And by legitimacy, what we mean is um, government decisions that are backed by something more than just force. Because we start from the idea that what we call government is the organization that has a monopoly over the legitimate use of force in a given geographical area. And that is something that Max Weber talked about. And many people have looked at it that way. You know, what's the government? How do we know if it is the government? Well, if it has a monopoly over the legitimate use of force in a geographical area, it's the government. But what do we mean by legitimate? Um, we mean um, something that is backed by something more than just force itself. In other words, you know, you could, um, the, uh, someone could come to your house and take your money with the force of a gun, and that would not be legitimate but the Internal Revenue Service can come and take your money from you, basically. Um, and that is legitimate. And why is that? Well, there are different ways to legitimize government, to make it right, to make it morally right. And he talks about these different systems. You know, charismatic rule meant that you know, these, are, these would be systems that, that go way back. But, you know, even into the present, there are some people who think that, for example, that you know, the, there were some followers of former President Trump who thought that, you know, he had the right to be president because they, I think, he had special qualities and um, that made him, you know, the rightful ruler regardless of what other, the election results were. And then 
that's not an uncommon belief throughout human history, to believe that a certain person has the right to rule. Other bases for legitimacy are tradition. It's the way we've always done it. Religion, many governments are based on religion. Uh, in socialist countries, during the years of communism, they believed that history, uh, the dynamics of history, uh, dialectical materialism made their system of government the right one. And then we come to ours. What Weber called the rational legal um, system of legitimacy, meaning that essentially the government is based on the rule of law and the consent of the governed. Um, in other words, we are not living under particular people, particular social classes, particular religions. We live under a government that is premised on the rule of law and that is legitimate because it was chosen and consented to by the people. Um, and now we'll move to a couple put this in the context of political theory, very famous people who preceded Weber, um, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Thomas Hobbes lived from 1588 to 1679. He wrote a very famous work of political theory called Leviathan, in which he said that, you know, we're uh, hypothetically, I mean, this is, I don't know if you should take this completely as a statement of the way he thought life was, but he says, imagine life before government. Just imagine it. It's a, what they call a state of nature. And he said that would be a horrible existence. It would be, life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It would be a war of all against all if we had no government. People would steal from each other, they'd kill each other, it'd be chaos. That was his view of things. Um, and he said, we, create, we created the government, humans. We created government to protect us from each other. And we gave it all the power, except the power to take our own life. That was the only power, because he said we created it to protect ourselves. And so the government shouldn't take our lives except under certain special circumstances. But his view is this thing he called Leviathan is government, a very, very powerful government with almost unlimited power. And this is the beginning of the idea of the consent of the governed, because his, his statement was that government, whether it be a monarchy or whatever form of government, is always based on the idea that we want something to protect us from ourselves. We want order, we want peace, we want safety and security, and we get it from government. That theory was taken forward by John Locke, who was lived from 1632 to 704. He was uh, someone you've probably heard of, very influential on the founders of the American Republic, the, the people like Madison and Hamilton and so forth. Locke was a, a very influential thinker from their standpoint. And he agreed there what we should premise our government on the idea of consent and on the idea that there was sort of a state of nature. But he said it wouldn't have been murderous. It would have been inconvenient. I mean, we he says we established government not to protect us from tearing each other to pieces, but to protect private property and individual liberties and to make life better for ourselves. He, he did think we could exist without government, but that we, we wouldn't want to. And he believed in natural rights, particularly the right to own private property. But he believed in limited government, not unlimited government like Hobbes Leviathan. And so he believed in the notion of uh, a realm of our lives that was private and, and out of the reach of government. But again, he believed in the legitimacy of this government would come through the consent of the governed. And that uh, he did believe there were times when revolution could potentially be justified. Um, if the government stopped doing what it was supposed to do and started doing um, exceeding its powers, because in his view it's supposed to be limited. Well, this is, as you'll see when we talk about the Constitution, we have uh, had this notion of a government that is essentially based on a contract with the people. We, our Constitution is something like that. Basically an agreement that the government will limit itself in certain ways. That idea comes from Locke. So in his view, um, a, a classic, we call Locke and Hobbes, or particularly Locke, classical liberals. Uh, this is the idea of a liberal democracy. And by liberal, we don't mean politically liberal like the Democratic Party. We mean um, limited government that respects basic rights and liberties, freedoms, liberal in that sense, freedom. So their view is, you know, that we have a society uh, of individual citizens and property owners who consent to be governed, who pay their taxes to a limited government that maintains internal law and order, defends the country, um, and uh, people enjoy living their lives because the government makes that, facilitates that process. Uh, 
So you sort of have a private sphere and a public sphere, so to speak. That is a model. Now, I, I, I think in practice, uh, we know that the private sphere and the public sphere, they're really not separate in that way. Uh, so much entanglement between private corporations and individuals and the government that's really, but this is a, this is a, a model an idealized model of, of how a classical liberal society would be organized. Um, the thing is, if we look closely at what the founders really put into practice, which we will talk about more uh, in greater depth when we analyze the Constitution and its provisions, their idea of a liberal democracy was not a pure or direct democracy, but what, what they always referred to as a republic. Um, and we call it, we do still call these things that we're calling republics, we still use the term liberal democracy. This is, this term republic is a term of art that the founders used and we don't have to always adhere to it, but um, it's fine to call the U.S. a democracy as opposed to republic, but they are making a useful distinction here. Um, their distinction at the time was, well, there have been many places throughout history that were based on uh, direct democracy. Demos meaning the people, Kratos meaning rule, democracy, rule by the people. And, and uh, Aristotle and Plato uh, talked about this. They said it's different than aristocracy, theocracy, etc. And that there would be direct participation in the decision making by the people. Now, you know, this of course raised the question who are the people? Because even in ancient Greece, um, where they you know, talked a lot about uh, democracy during the golden age of Pericles and so forth, there were huge swaths of the population who had no rights at all. They were slaves, and etc. So, you know, this question of the people was never all the people. It was never that way. Um, but to leave that aside for the moment, since this isn't really a political theory course, um, just understand that the founders, the people who wrote our constitution, were very concerned about the power of the majority. And they set up a government that would have, that had some participation in government by the people, but a lot of delegation of the decision-making power to people who were elected, a class of elected officials. And the founders used the term republic uh, for that. that. That's what they called it. Uh, representatives chosen in elections. Um, they are, there are different theories of how they should operate. One theory was they should do, uh, they should be trustees, others delegates. I mean, are they sent up there to you exercise their own judgment um, or are they sent there to do what the people who elected them wanted them to do trustee versus delegate and so forth um, and uh, but they did agree also on the notion of constitutionalism that is a written constitution with where the government had certain delegated powers and certain limits that it agreed to however uh, understand they viewed pure majority rule as a threat to the privileged and propertied minority. When they talked about minorities, they were talking mainly about the people who owned property and were fairly wealthy or well off. And they thought majority rule was a threat to property owners. When we talk about Federalist number 10, and you read it, you'll see that that's exactly what James Madison says. Now, so we start off with this idea of the US being some sort of a liberal democracy. And this is the consensus belief that you see reflected in you know the news media and so forth but social scientists you know and uh, other writers have looked at this very closely and have said wait a minute um, that's not really the way power is distributed it isn't just we're a bunch of equal citizens voting and choosing our elected representatives that's not what happens uh, instead they said as a matter of fact often small groups of wealthy and powerful people run societies and that is, they would argue that is true of this society too we call this elite theory. Small numbers of people, usually from an upper class, key sectors in society, the government, the military, the corporate sector, um, and connected with each, with each other socially in, in various other ways, uh, are actually the, the governing class, the ruling elite. That is, this is called elite theory. Um, and I'm going to, some of the key concepts are interlocking elites, elite recruitment, and so forth. So let's turn to that. This, this person here on the left is C. Wright Mills. He was a very famous elite theorist, a sociologist who wrote a lot about elite theory. And this is the basic model. The idea is that in reality, we're not all equal. Society is divided up into uh, masses, which is the vast majority of us, and an elite. The elite are key people in important organizations who hold uh, a lot of power in very important sectors of the society. 
you know, uh, and we'll talk about those sectors in just a sec. And they are connected with each other and the connections between the el elites in the different sectors he called interlocking directorates, that there are all these organizations that connect wealthy people. So for example, you know, Bill Gates made all this money uh, with Microsoft and now he's involved in education and, and uh, medicine and all these other areas by virtue of his participation in his foundation's participation in many with many other organizations in the educational field. People from the Gates Foundation came to UIC to talk with us about what they you know, might be willing to do for UIC if we did certain things they wanted us to do, etc. So people at the top connect with each other, uh, social clubs, uh, political organizations, uh, corporate boards, and all sorts of things. Um, and then the elite theories, the theory says they, they really influence the decisions that get made, and then those decisions are imposed on the masses. And what are we doing? We're distracted. Elite theorists would say, we are mostly distracted. We're watching movies, TV shows, you know, reality TV, and we're obsessing about, you know, who's going to marry who on some show or whatever, who's, who's going to win the lottery, and what do they do with their money when they win, and what's the latest movie, and, you know, what did Marvel come out with for a new superhero film, and, and, and on and on. And then every now and then elections happen, and then there's a gigantic, very expensive spectacle that takes place where we watch, and it's, a, it's a, in the view of elite theorists, it's a pageant that is put on to convince us that we are really making the differences. Now that is the way elite theorists view this. It's kind of cynical, but that is the way they view it, that the elections are really just part of the political spectacle. They are put on for our benefit to make us think that we are important and influential, to make us think that the government cares about us, and in reality they don't, and, uh, and all we're, we're really doing is legitimizing the decisions that are imposed on us by elites. So how is the, uh, uh, this is a sort of a picture of the interlocking elite. The idea is the people in the key organizations connect with each other, uh, culture, government, economy, and so forth. And then uh, they recruit people so that if you go to the right schools, even if you're not born into the elite, you can get into it, you can get recruited. Uh, but in, in so doing, in joining the elite classes, you get co-opted. So they would look at a person, an elite theorist would look at a person like Barack Obama, who was not born into an elite family, ultimately becomes very important, a, a president of the United States, and you know, very wealthy, etc. And they would argue he's been, you know, the only way you get into the elites is by adopting elite values. And they would argue that everyone who becomes an elite must do that. Well, you know, that's what elite theorists say, and I'll leave it to you to decide what you think about that. But there's a whole group of people who don't agree with that, uh, pluralists. This begins with James Madison. We're going to talk about him when we talk about the Federalist Papers. But the idea here is um, that <clears throat> he says that uh, groups, uh, political power is really held and exercised by groups that compete with each other. He calls it faction. He says in politics, it's inevitable that people form factions, they form groups. And uh, when they do that, they try to influence the government. And he says the key is that we, we don't want the, the faction of the majority, the biggest group, to control things. We want basically to have uh, people to have freedom, but we want to control and limit majority rule, or else that big group, the majority, could oppress the minority. And by the minority, he was worried about the rich. Um, but contemporary pluralists like Robert Dahl or Andrew McFarland of the UIC Political Science Department, who retired a few years ago, um, say, wait a minute, it's not really like Madison said. These, interest, it, it, they, we, these groups are very, very important interest groups, but they compete with each other. And in some sense, they cancel each other out. No one group dominates over time. And they argue there is no one elite. There are many types of different interest groups that compete with each other in every issue area. Uh, and sometimes it's called, uh, as Robert Dahl called it, polyarchy. It's not really a populist democracy, but it's not elite rule either. It's somewhere in between. Um, so this is just a model. In other words, the, the, the NRA and the Brady campaign compete with each other. What do they do? Lobbying, campaign contributions, litigation, all sorts of things. Everything that they can think of to try to win in their own issue area. So, you know, NRA tries to block gun control legislation. The Brady campaign tries to advance it. The Sierra Club tries to advance 
uh, global warming related uh, energy conservation, etc. Le uh, legislation, the oil industry lobbies try to block it. Uh, this is the, what they do. And so the argument goes that that's that pluralism is an answer to the elite theorists. There's actually a lot. Of then along comes Mansur Olson, uh, who got a Nobel Prize for Economics, a book called The Logic of Collective and he argues, again, we'll talk more about this in the future. Well, this is not the only time, but uh, he says the problem here is that uh, we, we aren't all equally organized. His argument is that producer interests, like business interests, are much more likely to get organized than consumers. So, for example, the, uh, the industry that produces computers, let's say, and software, well, they're organized. They have they have all kind of take all do all kinds of work to try to influence uh, government. Um, but do computer users organize? I mean, I don't belong to any computer user group. I don't think so. Uh, we all become basically like free riders. Organize at all now. Point being, the power to control politics and government is not equally distributed. Um, the group that we call the governed are not all equal. And you, you may remember this pyramid that I showed you on your previous video. Let's put this together. Let's put these, these two dis conversations. Most people don't know much about government, politics, policy, and they don't even participate. So you know, how do we argue that, you know, that we, uh, the people, control the government? Doesn't that cast a democratic model? An elite theory, you remember this model. Elite theory uh, emphasizes inequality and lack of participation. It tells us, no, wait a minute, at the political level, there's all kinds of interest group competition, which is a substitute, really, for an informed and participatory electorate. So therefore, they argue, we really do have uh, a functioning liberal democracy. Now, this is a debate that I think you should feel free to take up uh, in your discussion sections and on our discussion boards and among yourselves. I mean, to what extent do we have a democracy? Uh, I have previously told you that you know politics matters. The outcomes definitely matter. And they, there's no doubt that they do matter to us. And I have also said that um, when people organize in groups, it is very clear that they can, or, or even if they don't organize, if they just vote in large numbers, and if they organize, they can certainly impact our government. And when we talk about um, political parties, interest groups, and social movements, you'll see there are many ways for people to organize. And there is no doubt throughout our history that organized people and participating people, people just voters, have, uh, have had enormous impact on our politics, on the civil rights movement, the movement for equality and equity for women, uh, and on and on. The environmental movement, it, it, participation does make a huge difference. Um, the key to it, ordinarily, is participation in organized groups of one sort or another, though. And so uh, I ask you to really to just to give some thought to this, uh, how you think po uh, power is structured in our society, and also how you think it should be structured. And that's what I'm going to turn to now. Um, because this is a critical thinking issue uh, and I want to spend a little time on this because it's um, often when we talk about politics we mix up and we talk past each other when we discuss these things because we're making two different kinds of statements um, and, and I hope you have been exposed to this elsewhere but let's just talk about it to make sure we all understand it. There's such a thing as normative statements and empirical statements. Um, a normative statement uh, is one that is um, uses the a value judgment, expresses the term ought. Uh, an empirical statement is based on what is, what you say is. So for example, and I'm going to go into some of the characteristics in just a moment, but just to tie this to this whole who rules conversation, you can ask who really rule, who rules, or you can ask who should rule, you see. Now, if you say, who rules? That's an empirical question. Who is actually governing this country? Who is in charge? Who has the power? That's a question of is, you know, what is actually happening? A related question, but, not, but a different question, is who should rule? So, you know, you can believe that this nation is governed by an elite, but that it should be governed under a more pluralistic or more democratic uh, system. 
Or you could believe that we have too much democracy and it should be run by an elite. Maybe it would be more like James Madison. Oh, there's too much democracy, you know. Um, but understand that these are two different statements. And I just want to go into this. Like, you know, a person could say, you know, Joe Biden, a normative statement, an ought statement. A value statement it could be Joe Biden, Donald Trump, uh, Barack Obama, whoever is a good president or was a good president or a bad president. And if you're say, making those statements, those are normative statements. They're based on values. Um, they're based on moral ideas of right and wrong. They are sometimes we use the term prescriptive statements for those. Uh, now the pro the thing about those statements, and we have to use those statements when we talk about politics. I think. Uh, it, the problem is that you really can't uh, test whether they're true or not. I mean, normative statement, it isn't a true statement or a false statement. They're expressions of belief and judgment, and they're not true or false. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes in politics. Be, I mean, people argue with each other because um, they argue that um, their moral statements are somehow true and other people's moral statements are false, and it just doesn't work that way. You know, value judgments are, are not... Um, true or false. You're, you're, it's about competing value systems and, and we probably want to respect each other's value systems. Um, but the other, and often, you know, in the humanities, there are many, many normative statements and that is kind of the, the coin of the realm in the humanities. Um, empirical statements are a bit different. That would be like if I say Joe Biden is the U.S. president or Donald Trump was the U.S. president or that sort of thing. That is a statement of something that is. Or I could try to make a prediction I could predict that I think the next president will be, you know, um, you know Tucker Carlson or whoever. And um, those are empirical statements. They are, uh, whether they are things that have already happened or I think things that I'm trying to predict, they are about things that occur or will occur or have occurred in the real world. Facts, observation, they are descriptive. They can be tested for their truth. That's the key thing about an empirical statement. You can test it to see whether it's true or not. You can wait around to see if my prediction was true or not. Or you can, you can uh, examine, is it true that Donald Trump was president? Is it true that Joe Biden is? But see, these are, these are empirical statements. That's, and, and they can be disproved. And that's why we uh, associate them with the sciences, uh, the natural sciences and the social sciences. Um, and it's, it's important because and we need to make this distinction because in order to talk about politics, we need to use both the empirical and the normative statements. Because politics involves the real world, yes, and it involves making choices. But often those choices involve competing and conflicting values and value systems. So, um, you know, when we talk about this, we've got, to, we've got to understand as we talk with each other, what kind of statement are we making? Um, are, are, because... If, and they're related and they're, they're, they can't really be ever completely separated because our statements about how we believe sh things should be are almost always predicated on statements about how things are and also about what could be, what is possible, what is not positive, possible. So, you know, when we uh, are trying to test, you know, do we think a normative statement, do we want to believe it or not? Uh, let's take this example. I believe like President X, whoever is good or bad. What do we do? We look at the factual premises. What are your factual premises when you for your belief, your normative statement? What are, what facts is it premised on? Are those did those facts happen or not? You know, you I, well I believe President X did the following things. Is that true or not? You know, I believe the economy was great when President uh, X was president, and we can look at that. Well, wait a minute, is that true or not? Because maybe you believe that, but maybe it's not true. Maybe factually that's not true. We can then examine your value system and say, what kind of, well, why, why do you think, what is good about the president? What, what do you mean by good? What is, what is good versus bad for you? And then we can look at the logic of the person, of people's statements. So that's what we do with normative statements. We, we look at the factual premises, we examine the value system that underlies them, and we examine the logic that says, if these facts are true, then I think, you know, that proves President X was good. Well, we look at the logic behind that, too. Um, you know, for an example, uh, what, I, what I mean by normative statements being premised on empirical ones, and, and this is the way we, we examine and critically assess normative statements, oh, uh, we, we could say, you know, we with, withdrew from the war in Afghanistan, um, and a person could argue that we should have done it, or 
we should have continued. We should have withdrawn or we should have continued. Because why? Well, because we were not winning or winning. Well, should have is a normative statement. The whole thing, that's a normative statement. Um, and But that place where we get to um, w what was going on, were we winning or losing? Well, that's a factual assertion. And it's an empirical statement. And we can look at the factual evidence. We can look at fatalities, at territory controlled, uh, at the strength of the opposition, and on and on and on. Um, we can look at the values that underlie the normative statement. We can look at the factual evidence under the empirical statement and the logical connections between those facts and the ultimate value judgment. So, you know, if you want to, you can do that. I can leave it to you and there's different ways to do it. But how would you analyze what happened with our withdrawal from Afghanistan from a normative standpoint? Should we have done it or should we not have done it? What facts would we use? What values do you bring to bear on it? And, and how, what is your logic? Now, empirical statements are different. Uh, empirical statements, what we're going for there is truth and falsehood, including the ones that would underlie that statement about Afghanistan. Uh, and what we, what we use for uh, testing those statements, observation, measurement, sometimes experimentation, and also logic, our minds. Uh, and we also sometimes look at the source of information, uh, the data that we're using. What is the source of the data? Is it credible data you know, or not? Um, most political scientists study American politics using some variation of the scientific method. Um, so, you know, they start with uh, a question, an observation or question. Um, why, is, why are things a certain way? They research the whole topic area. They develop what we call hypotheses. You know, like scientific hypotheses, we do the same thing in political science. Um, we try to figure out what the relationship is between one thing and another. Uh, that, you know, we call them variables, and you take you know courses. We offer courses that explain how this research method works. We construct experiments to test our hypotheses, analyze data, re and publish the conclusion so that other people can read them. And uh, and so our research is constantly peer reviewed and tested and compared with the results that other people find out. That's what they do in biology and physics and chemistry. We do similar things in the social sciences, including definitely political science. There's just a lot of that. So it's, it's a scientific method. That doesn't mean that political science is as scientific as biology or chemistry or physics. It certainly isn't. But many people try to make it as scientific as they can because they're trying to be accurate. And they're trying to come up with ideas that, um, that, that can stand the test of further research and the test of time, as opposed to just being opinions. So a lot of what you read in the course is, is that type of study. Uh, <clears throat> finally, let's just talk about a bit about what we use for data. Um, uh, political scientists who are doing this type of empirical analysis, they have lots and lots of different kinds of data that they use. Uh, one of the most commonly used uh, sources of data is election results. Hmm, we've talked about some of that already. We, the votes are counted. And you know we have all kinds of ways of analyzing that. We have statistical tools, quite sophisticated ones, that help us analyze election results. We can also look at the votes taken in legislatures. Again, we can count those. This is what we call quantitative data. Election results are all these things are quantitative data. We can count it up. We can use statistical measures to, to really look at the patterns in legislative voting and figure out what did the Democrats do? What did the Republicans do? What influenced their votes? We can look in money as well. Uh, the um, uh, co campaign contributions. We can look at, we look often at survey research. We go out and ask people questions and the answers become data. Sometimes we interview people and we have words and often uh, we use um, tools called content analysis tools, computer programs that help us to analyze interviews, uh, speeches, articles, documents, you know, entire news files. You know, we can generate thousands and thousands of news articles and analyze them using computer programs, looking for particular words. Do the same thing with interviews. Uh, census data. The census, which we do every 10 years, is a tremendous source of data for political scientists to analyze, combining it often with other things, marketing research and other tools. I mean, I'm just giving you some examples. There are many, many, many sources of data. Um, we can even analyze the opinions written by Supreme Court and other appellate court justices. We can look at the words. We can also look at how the justices voted and count up their votes. And often they don't like that because they'd rather we you know, didn't try to turn their decisions into numbers, but we do. And then there are just many, many government data sources 
uh, involving money, taxation, budgets, appropriations, spending, uh, and as you know, just oceans and oceans of data are available. We also have a lot of data available on wars and international conflicts. Uh, there, there are many databases that have been created by political scientists to study these things. And, and of course, I, that, I'm just scratching the surface. There are just innumerable other sources of data on crime, the economy, employment, education, uh, everything you could think of that the government and large uh, business corporations do. You know, many uh, of our sources of data are used by other disciplines like economics, sociology, um, uh, use the same sources of data and they might interpret them in different ways because you know as I said political scientists are concerned about many of the questions that we've just been talking about which might not be the same questions that uh, an economist would be concerned about we uh, the economists might be concerned about markets and how they function and when they don't when they don't work and when they do work uh, what the outcomes of market decisions are we um, I suppose are are mostly concerned about um, these questions we've been discussing, about the functioning of our government, um, our systems, our institutions, um, and uh, the way it, those decisions impact all of us. So that will conclude this presentation uh, for our second week, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it.